Hello, Augies Worldwide. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG. And yes, about 25% of the viewers of this channel are outside the United States, usually in English speaking countries, although I have a fairly large contingent in Germany. Hello to you wherever you are. This question comes from Michael McBride, KJ6MGV. And this has to do with his station grounding and bonding to the utility ground. He says, I just moved from Dayton, Nevada, and I happen to know where Dayton, Nevada is. I flew over it several times. I may even have landed at that airport. It's a tiny town in Nevada. So moving to Grants Pass, Oregon has got to be shocked to the system because Grants Pass is a pretty good sized place. Dayton is one of these towns where the town is shorter than the runway. Our Gunnison up here is the same. Even though there are commercial flights in there, they start beyond one side of the town and come all the way out the other side of the town. It's crazy. Okay, so he wants to set up his station in a corner of his garage. The home has an oofer ground with access from inside the garage just below the location of my workbench. Is it appropriate to ground all my station equipment via a single grounding strip mounted inside the garage and then bond that strip to the utility ground inside the wall? I would not do that. First of all, let's show what a newfer ground is. Okay, here is a slab. Great big giant concrete slab, and we're looking at it obliquely. Okay, inside here, there's all sorts of rebar and things like that. And Ufer ground, O-F-E-R, this was actually a person, he was a PhD, he was helping the Army ground some equipment in Arizona. They found out that that soil's awful hard down there, so he did this Ufer ground. Concrete does make a pretty good connection to ground. It's a piece of rebar that comes all the way across here, okay, and you don't notice it because it's in with all the other rebar, okay, and this is often comes up in the wall or inside the outside wall, and so your utility grounds to the oofer ground. Now, that's great. Now, if you're going to put your station in here, in a corner of the garage, I think that's what you said they would do, inside the garage, okay, below the location of his workbench, what you need to do. Behind your workstation, you've got a single point where you ground all of your equipment. All the equipment grounds go to that single point. And then I would recommend going through the wall out to a an actual eight foot ground rod, okay? An actual eight foot ground rod. And then bonding that ground rod and come in a hole right next to that oofer ground, okay? Now, if you've got a panel in there, you want to bring this down to as close to the floor as you can get it, okay? And then these two are bonded. Now, the oofer ground, I would not recommend using a safety ground as your station ground. Put this in a couple, three, four, five feet away. Or if you're over in this corner, you put your ground in there and then bond to over here. That's what I think you should probably do. Now, of course, where you ground, outside this is where your lightning arresters go outside okay and you've got that big cable attaching your inside station ground to the system ground right here all right the oofer ground's perfectly legitimate way of grounding unless you have good pictures of it uh, during construction or else the county building inspector has some sort of a record that there's an oofer ground there. They won't necessarily believe that it's an oofer ground. It's very difficult to test a ground. Now you can test whether multiple grounds are working. For example, when you ground that oofer ground to your ground rod, if you use a ground tester on both the oofer ground and on your ground rod below where all the clamps are, you can actually get a reading how many ohms the ground is. You may find Grants Pass, Oregon has a reasonably normal climate. It's somewhat inland from the coast, so it doesn't get the wet weather they do along the coast. There's a line running down through Oregon. On this side, it's tropical forest. On this side, it's more desert. 
So there's a mountain range right along the coast, and that mountain range is pretty adept at keeping the rain from going very far inland. I remember I was on a motorcycle ride. We were going through Portland in the rain. Man, it rained. It filled my boots with water. It was that rainy. And we got past Portland, working our way to Astoria, and we crossed that line, and good grief. Green, 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 green. There was an area that had been logged. They logged a, a chunk of land, about an acre, and they pulled up all the stumps, and the stumps were in this humongous pile. I went, we went by an old house, abandoned house, and there were little creepers coming up over the top of the thing, and the roof was covered with moss and everything like that. I got to tell you, that part of Oregon, if you leave anything outside for any length of time, whoa, and you got to keep track of your roof. You don't want the moss getting in there and peeling the roof apart. It is gorgeous. It is beautiful. But boy, does it get rain. Olympia National Park up in Washington is also part of that rain belt. And gee whiz, green, green, green. I mean, wow. Yes, you can use the Ufer wall. I would have a separate ground rod for your vertical antenna, which will ground again with a copper ground rod just outside the shack with the lightning arresters for each coax and then bond that to the Ufer ground. I wouldn't use the Ufer ground as your primary ground. Uh, at, at a minimum, you've got all your electrical system connected to that, but that should work pretty good. What this picture shows you are some plate that will go around a 5 8 inch ground rod, can be clamped very firmly to that ground rod, and it'll give you four or six holes, depending on the model, in which to mount lightning arresters. And that works really well. If you have just a single arrestor, it'll have a, a screw coming out of it like this at the bottom. You can put a hose clamp between this and hold it to the ground rod and get that on there good and tight, okay? We don't solder anything having to do with the ground path because if there is a sudden amount of high current, it'll heat up the wire enough that it will instantly boil the solder and splatter it, and you don't want any of that, okay? So that's why all ground connections are made with crimp connections, the ground connection on the back of the radio has a little wing nut or something like that, so you can get good and tight on it, but we don't use solder for those. Okay, so there you have it. I hope that answers your question. I hope you enjoy your new home in Grants Pass, Oregon. Until we next meet, 73.